Charlie, I think on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, my scientific training comes to the fore, and sad as it may be to say, this life is all we've got. But I don't know, Tuesdays, Thursdays, maybe Saturdays, I'm thinking that that, that can't be right. I, I'm, I'm this self-conscious being. How could I not exist? And the last day of the week, maybe I give myself a break and don't even think about it. Um, uh, how do we deal with this concept of an afterlife? Is it even worth going beyond and trying to investigate it? I'm kind of amused because you've essentially repeated the comment of one of the greatest mediums who ever lived, Eileen Garrett, uh -oh. who was investigated scientifically many times, and she apparently channeled surviving spirits and all that. And when asked toward the end of her life what she thought about it, she said on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, she thought it was just what it seemed to be. She was channeling spirits. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, she thought the psychologists were right. Her unconscious mind was impersonating all these things and whatnot. Well, I'm glad and I'm Sunday, at least the she opposite tried, of what Sunday, she she said. tried not to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the opposite of her. I'm the opposite days. I, if, if I was the same as her, then I'd really worry. Maybe she was channeling me. <laughs> You can, you can talk about afterlife in terms of what do various religions believe, but again, as a scientist, I prefer to try to go back to data. What can we actually find out about this? And there are two kinds of data. One is things like near-death experiences where people feel they got a glimpse of what the afterlife was like. And you, you have no idea how accurate that was, but it's data of one sort. The other is the work of spiritualist mediums who claim to channel the souls of people who survive death and who will then tell you about what it's like. Now, this gets real tricky because you don't know how much of this is indeed imagination. So there's an initial, a preliminary step you take, right? If you were going to consult somebody, you'd want to know whether they were an expert or whether they were considered a fool. If you go to consult a spiritualist medium who says she's going to bring Uncle Joe back and you can then ask about the afterlife, you'd first kind of want to see, is this really Uncle Joe? So there's been a lot of investigation over the past century in which investigators have said, does this alleged spirit produce specific verifiable evidence that would have been known to Uncle Joe rather than something anything can make up. You know, so if all Uncle Joe ever says is, you know I loved you and I want you to live a good <laughs> life, yeah, but anybody can say that. But you know, if he says my cat was named Willow and whatnot, and he indeed had a cat named Willow, <laughs> you get a little impressed. That's, that's one of the many maybes, okay? I don't think there's been enough work to come to a real conclusion about whether anybody actually survives death. But there's enough evidence that I wouldn't just dismiss it. Even methodologically, in the last case with a medium getting this information nobody else can know, maybe, maybe she's telepathic and reading right. my mind or reading mere, somebody mere else's mind. Mere telepathy. Mere telepathy, right. I love the mere telepathy <laughs> explanation. And there's something to it because that could be the case. So people came up with ways to try to get around this. For instance, they would send someone to ask the medium about your Uncle Joe who didn't know your Uncle Joe. So if it was telepathy, the medium would have to link through two minds to get it. And they're it, get, it gets very complicated, okay? But my whole assessment of that, and again, it's not my primary field, is there's enough evidence of survival that I wouldn't simply throw it out. But I don't think there's enough that you can come to any final conclusion on it. But the third thing is, I think it's really important to know. It's going to make a difference in the way I live if I figure I've got a few years left and then oblivion versus I'm going to be around for a long time and the consequences of the way I am are going to play out over a much longer period. I'd like to know. Look, and I think it goes beyond that. I think as human beings, we, we are programmed or it's part of our intrinsic nature to desire and want to know and to suppress that is uh, a suppresses a, a part of our, our natural nature. And I think that's important to explore. And I want to do it even if I feel reasonably confident I'm not going to make any progress. Even, mm -hmm. even the fact that I am reasonably confident I will not know the answer, maybe not even make any progress whatsoever, I'm still compelled to make the, make the effort. Yeah, you know, I've been involved in parapsychological research for close to 50 years now, and there are very few areas I can point to where I can say there's been definite progress. 
Of course, there's hardly been any research because it's so underfunded. But on the other hand, it's been a really intriguing problem. I'd, I'd much rather deal with really important problems that I can only get a partial answer to than get very precise about something of no real significance. <laughs> I'm fascinated that in dealing with this question of the afterlife, you have left out the two big pieces of data that a lot of people talk about. One is the vast amount of religious tradition, doctrine that talks about that. Most religions, not all, but most religions have an afterlife as a component, and some would point to that enormity of tradition as demonstrating the reality of it. But you didn't do that. No. Uh, years and years of tradition are years and years of tradition. But whether that's truth to begin with or whether it's a fantasy to begin with and a zillion years of elaboration of the fantasy, I don't know. <laughs> I want to keep going back to data. What do people actually experience? Now, the other side is the scientific view that says, look, we know that our life is based upon the brain, and if somebody hits you on the head, you can go unconscious, your brain dies, you die, and that's it. I mean, what's the need to discuss it? That's the dominant view. I mean, I don't particularly need to argue for that. It's the interesting exceptions, like this mediumistic data that suggests some communicators have survived death, or the extrasensory perception that seems to indicate there's more to us than just brain functioning. That's what's really interesting. And how suggestive is that, that there is something beyond this physical life? I mean, scale zero to 100. What does Charlie Tart say today? I'd give it a 75 at this point, okay? I mean, I know that as human beings, sometimes we can read another's mind. Sometimes we can pick up the state of the physical world at a distance. Sometimes we can know the future. Sometimes we can affect the physical world directly. Those sound like the kind of characteristics of some kind of critter that might indeed survive physical death. Meanwhile, let's not use that as an excuse to neglect the physical side of life. Let's actually use science to investigate the possibility of souls instead of saying it's not worth looking at. When you say it's not worth looking at, that simply means you're tremendously committed to current theories. And if the history of science tells us anything, it's that scientists are always making the mistake of getting stuck in current theories and refusing to look at data that later turns out to be important. What about the other side, where science says that, look, the brain is all there is, you hit the brain on the head and it goes unconscious, hit it hard enough and you die, and that's it? It's quite legitimate for science to say the brain is very important. To say it's all there is is kind of an arrogant statement, especially when most scientists have not looked at the data that doesn't fit that at all. If I had to sum up my understanding of what we are, I would use the analogy, let's say, of I'm a computer user, and the I is something different from the computer. The I is the mind, the computer is the hardware, the body, and so forth, with its own programs. I'm all for finding out how the computer works. I could use it better that way. But I want to find out what the characteristics of the user are, what this I is that somehow is there. We should be investigating the experiences that people call soul, or something like soul, and not just throwing them out as impossible. To put theory first is scientism. It's making a dogmatic religion out of current scientific understanding. That's not the way we progress. That sounds like a ghost in a machine. It certainly sounds like a ghost in a machine, so let's investigate the nature of the ghost <laughs> instead of trying to exercise it. <laughs>